solitary, not solitary. Hell is a very small place book discussion. I must tell you, it's going to be a fantastic uh, discussion tonight. And first, I want you to know that we are live streaming today from Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. We would like for you to use the hashtags. We would like for you to use hashtag solitary, not solitary, as well as hashtag hell's a very small place. Follow along and comment. We care about what you say. Also, shout out to our co-sponsors, Unlock the Box, National Religious Campaign Against Torture, Children Center, excuse me, Center for Children's Law and Policy, the News Press Publishing, and Solitary Watch. Please put your comments or questions in the comments section on whatever platform you're watching us on. Once again, we'd love to know what you think. Tonight is going to be very interactive. And so what I would like to do is just share with you why we are here tonight and why it's so important to have this discussion about this amazing book, Hell is a Very Small Place. October is the month where a lot of things are happening. And one thing in particular is Halloween. Many of us as children and still now as adults, we love to be horrified. But the reality is in the United States, there are many houses of horrors called jails and prisons where individuals are locked away in cells. And we're talking about cells that only allow you, some of them, just a small window to look out of. That small window is the only window of hope that individuals have who are behind those walls. And so tonight we will be bringing to you and to life the discussions about what happens in solitary. I can't say that solitary confinement is something that everyone knows about. And so what I would like for you to know about solitary confinement is that if there is one thing that human beings need, it is human contact. And for a human being to be locked away without any human contact for 15 days or more, according to the United Nations, the brain begins to deteriorate. It is an atrocity against humanity to lock people away in cells. And that is, not only is it an atrocity, it's something that we all have to help put a stop to. And so I say this, that we have with us a wonderful group of individuals. And so we have with us uh, Sarah, we have Sway, and we have Vanessa. And we will have this uh, discussion and uh, once again, like I said, we would like for you to, uh, you know, read along and also get the book. Uh, we encourage you uh, that, you know, you can consider buying the book and it's available on Amazon, Thrift Books and Better World Books. And it's published by The New Press. Also, there is a reading guide available on Solitary Watch's website. And we'll put the link in the chat for you. And now, before we begin the discussion, I would like to prepare you for an amazing video. And this video will give those new people, those of you who are new to the idea of what solitary confinement is, it will give you a nice picture of why we're here and, and why it matters. And so this uh, video is by an uh, artist by the name of Molly Crabtree. I'm sorry, Molly Crabapple. In July 2013, 30,000 state prisoners went on hunger strike in California. The strike lasted for two months. It was the second one since 2011. 
prisoners were protesting solitary confinement, what many people consider to be a form of torture. In solitary, your world is a gray concrete box. You spend between 22 and 24 hours a day alone in your cell. Your bed is a concrete slab with a thin mattress. Three times a week, guards shackle you and take you to the showers for 15 minutes. For exercise, you pace around another concrete box. Sometimes a bit of ceiling is uncovered. This is the only time you'll see the sky. As a punishment, the use of solitary confinement is often an arbitrary decision. Nearly 3,000 people are held in Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City, California. Over a third are in solitary, most of them because of quote-unquote gang affiliation. But that's a meaningless phrase. Gang affiliation might mean reading a book by a Black Panther, or drawing Aztec patterns, or even having a tattoo. But Pelican Bay isn't alone in this. Around the country, you can land in solitary for your art, your reading, your beliefs, your gender status, your sexual orientation, or your friends. Women have ended up in solitary after reporting being raped by guards. Transgender prisoners are often put in solitary just for being trans. Prisons say this is for their protection. There is no limit to how long someone can be held in solitary confinement, and very little evidence is needed to justify holding a person in solitary indefinitely. At Pelican Bay, hundreds of people have spent over a decade inside. According to the UN, 15 days in solitary confinement is torture that can cause permanent psychological damage. William Blake, who's been in solitary in a prison in New York State since 1988, said, Dying couldn't take but a short time if you or the state were to kill me. In SHU, I have died a thousand internal deaths. Solitary also enables abuse. The Dallas Six were inmates in Luzerne County. In 2009, they contacted human rights groups to complain about torture by guards. According to the Six, in the privacy of solitary, guards would starve prisoners, beat them, and strap them to restraint chairs for up to 18 hours at a time. In April 2010, guards beat and restrained a fellow prisoner. The six covered their cell windows to draw the attention of a superior. In response, guards beat them bloody and the prison charged them with rioting. The prison didn't explain how people can riot if they're locked alone in their cells. According to a lawyer for the Center for Constitutional Rights, prisoners in solitary are never granted parole. Because of this, a person sentenced to between five and 20 years can often spend the full 20 incarcerated. Prisoner's best hope for staying out of prison after release is maintaining bonds with loved ones while they're inside. But solitary destroys families. Those in solitary aren't even allowed contact visits. It was only after going on a brutal hunger strike that Pelican Bay inmate Gabriel Reyes got to hug his daughters. It had been 18 years. Many prisons even ban phone calls for those in solitary confinement. Personal letters may never be delivered. Books may be taken or withheld. This past November, U.S. officials told United Nations Committee that, quote, there is no systematic use of solitary confinement in the United States. But as of 2013, this country was holding over 80,000 people in solitary confinement, some of whom were only 14 years old. Because of press and protests, there have been tiny reforms. Pelican Bay is reviewing the prisoners isolated because of gang affiliation. In September 2014, a memo by New York City's Correction Commissioner Joseph Ponte promised that Rikers Island would stop locking teens in solitary by the end of the year. But it's not enough. 80,000 humans remain alone in concrete boxes. When will they be out? Going to give you a moment. What a video. But I think it's time to really get this discussion on the road. And so I am going to pass it to Sarah Shord. She is a trauma informed journalist, a playwright, amongst many other things. And so I'm going to go ahead on and, and let her introduce herself and uh, get things started here. Sarah? Thank you, Nahisa. It's, it's amazing to be here, um, standing beside these other, these giants, um, incredible organizers and survivors, 
not to mention, I imagine all of the survivors and family members that are um, here with us um, on this Zoom. I wanna honor you for showing up, for your presence here, for your strength and your vision. Um, so I'll introduce the book, Hell is a Very Small Place. I'm one of the co-editors. I edited the, the book along with my two colleagues, Jean Casella and James Ridgway of Solitary Watch. Um, the late James Ridgway, who I also wanna honor um, his incredible contribution. James was an investigative journalist that broke a lot of ground and uncovered a lot about solitary confinement. And Jim and Jean at Solitary Watch really kicked off a lot more visibility around this issue. And I've been working with the two of them for the last 10 years or so. James passed two years ago. So um, every time I speak about this issue, I, I honor him and his contribution. And so Hell is a Very Small Place is a collection of essays, of writings by people in solitary confinement that we collected all around the country. We got the widest swath of, of people as far as identity, age, um, ethnicity, and from different parts of this country. We traveled to prisons all across the country. And this was part of an investigation that I did that led um, to also a play that I wrote called The Box, which has now been toured across the country and the End of Isolation tour as legislative art to communities across the country that are trying to ban this practice. Um, so Hell is a Very Small Place is um, full of a brilliant writing, really writing, if it, more than anything else, you know, talking about the, the holiday, um, the Halloween, the fact that, that this is what we're, we are um, evoking. It, our, our society, we like to be scared of the boogeyman, right? We get, we get a little thrill out of it, out of playing um, with that, that idea that there is, there is an other that does harm. There is no boogeyman. Um, the people that we lock in our prisons and jails are our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers. And they are people that society has failed oftentimes again and again through poverty, systemic racism, lack of resources, lack of mental health um, treatment. So um, we're here to, to talk about not the, just the horror of solitary confinement, but the humanity of the tens of thousands of people that we force this torture on every day in this country. Um, I came to this work through my own experience. I was tortured and held as a political hostage 12 years ago by the Iranian government. Um, I was living in the Middle East and I was captured and held in solitary confinement for 410 days. And I came back to this country after living in the Middle East, working as a journalist. And I came back and I found that this practice is far more widespread in this country than any country in the world. It's used as a control mechanism that enables mass incarceration. It enables us to warehouse human beings that we have failed as a society, that we should be helping, that we should be rehabilitating and giving um, so many more resources to, and also giving the opportunity to be accountable for their actions if they have done harm. Um, in prison, there's no chance of accountability. There is no justice. Um, so that, so by the book, I'm gonna read from my introduction, and then you're also gonna hear from our other guests on the panel tonight, um, Vanessa Ramos from Disability Rights California. Um, the incredible work that they're doing is something everyone should look into on this call. They're the um, leaders in trying to pass a bill that would ban solitary confinement in California in alignment with the Mandela rules, which is the international standard on solitary confinement that no one should be in except for a very last resort and for no longer than two weeks, um, 15 days, because anything more than that can actually cause permanent brain damage. Um, it affects the frontal lobe, which is the part of our brain that helps us make good decisions. So this is not the place that people that, that um, need our help um, and are the most vulnerable inside our prisons should be put. Um, you're also gonna hear from Sue Pineda from the Center for Children's Law and Policy. He's also the co-host of an incredible youth podcast called Not in Isolation, The Voices of Youth. Um, so you're gonna get to hear from some amazing giants in the movement. And first, um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the introduction that I wrote to Hell is a Very Small Place. And, and after I read, we're gonna have a chance to discuss a little bit 
And the same is going to go for Nafisa and Sway and Vanessa. There'll be a chance to hear from you all and, and to discuss what we are um, reading. So this is the introduction from Hell is a Very Small Place. At some point, you're going to snap. This might be after one week or one year, depending on how you're wired. At first, the scream ripping through your throat is a welcome release. You ball up your fists and pound on your cell door, vomiting every expletive you can think of. You damn the guards to hell, along with the system, with the system and every person who ever cursed your life. A guard yells at you to shut the fuck up. You tell him to fuck himself and scream louder, choking on your own snot and angry tears. After a while, you collapse, curl up on the hard floor of your cell and enjoy a few of the best hours of sleep you've had in a very long time. When you open your eyes again, the system, your system is immediately flooded by the same instinctual rage. You begin pounding on the steel door of your cell, but this time when you scream, no one shouts back. Hours later, when the lunch cart rumbles by, you find you've been skipped. You start up again, your fists raw, your knuckles chafed and bloody. When the guards do arrive, they come with tear gas, batons drawn. They come to make you choke on your screams. Days later, you've appeared to calm down, to settle in. Yet the scream doesn't stop. You try not to hear it as you brush your teeth. Take your meds, force yourself to do push-ups, or attempt to focus on reading a magazine. As long as you're stuck in this coffin, that silent scream becomes the backdrop of every moment of your waking life. It could last a month, a year, a decade, or the rest of your life, yet no one will ever hear it but you. I spent 410 days in solitary confinement while being held as a political hostage by the Iranian government from 2009 to 2011. Upon returning to the United States, I discovered that this draconian practice, antithetical to any pretense of rehabilitation, is used as a routine control mechanism in US prisons, far more extensively than any country in the world or any country in history. In solitary confinement, a gray, limitless ocean stretches out in front of and behind you, an emptiness and loneliness so all-encompassing, it threatens to erase you. Whether you're in that world a month, a year, or a decade, you experience the slow march of death. Day by day, you lose your connection to everything outside the prison walls, everything you once knew and everything you once were. People in solitary commit suicide at a much higher rate than any other incarcerated population. Some go visibly crazy, whipping their skin raw, eating their own feces, or cutting off their genitals. Others adjust, showing no outward signs of insanity. But what if the adaptation itself is proof of how effective this form of torture can be? What if the silent scream internalizes what's being done to you, making you, identify, making you identify with or even become your own torturer? So that's an excerpt from the introduction that I wrote for Hell is a Very Small Place. The rest of the essays are from people, many of which are still in solitary confinement in this country today as we sit here. So thank you for listening. Um, I think we're going to have a little time for discussion if anyone else in the panel um, would like to share anything. That was powerful, Sarah. It, for anyone who's experienced uh, that type of horror, that description takes you back, you know, and, and you relive it. And so for myself and I'm sure the other participants that it was in a sense, reliving a trauma again. And so, uh, you know, I do, I, I open that up for uh, either Vanessa or Sway to chime in on that. Yeah, I, I definitely commend you, Sarah, for, you know, a lot of the people involved in this movement um, get involved because of their personal circumstances, or unfortunate circumstances. 
And so to create something like this, be a part of creating something like this, that's, you know, thinking about incarceration, my navigation through it, um, like as a, as a man, or as a young man, I would say, um, you know, sometimes I think about like my firsthand experience and how that helps me navigate why I'm a part of this movement. But oftentimes we don't think about the women, you know, sometimes there's children born in facilities. And so those, uh, those voices definitely need to be echoed um, as well, uplifted. And so for you to share pieces of your experience, you know, and to use that into creating something that's powerful, that comes from a traumatic place, you know, I, I wholeheartedly commend you for doing that and also for allowing me to be here and just hear you. You know, it's one thing to read it, but it's one thing to hear it. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, thank you, Sway and Nafisa for, for that. It's Sarah echoing, you know, our fellow panelists, you know, adjust your motherfucking crown, queen, you mm -hmm. know, because you really brought that home. And, you know, like Sway was saying, you know, a lot of our work is shaped through our own personal experience. And, uh, you know, for me, hearing about um, what you experienced in Iran and knowing that it happens here in the U.S., is so um it just moves me it really shapes the work that i do uh it encourages me to continue the fight forward um and the fight uh, ahead i really loved your you calling out the othering that we do right where it's them they the boogeyman and it's like no bitch like we become the like the system yeah. is the boogeyman like it's a sham you know and it really has me thinking about you know at what point does someone stop being my neighbor right you know and may i reflect on uh, the brilliance of your literature and your storytelling abilities and the collective power so that that othering stops, you know, as we move forward in peace. Um, so thank you so, so much. Gracias. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, and you know, that story is based on the incredible people that I met inside prisons in the US. Um, it's not a literal thing. I wasn't tear gassed in prison, to be clear, but it happens all across this country. So that's my creative interpretation of what it's like in this country. Um, and, but um, you know, I'm here for this movement as a as an anti-racist, you know, white abolitionist. I think it's really, really important for you know people that don't have direct um, contact with someone, have, don't have a loved one in prison, which is a lot of white communities or affluent communities that may think they're not affected by this system. No one in our society is not affected by this system because it dehumanizes all of us to have millions of people locked in cages. Um, and it, every institution in our culture is affected by, by the um, disgrace of what we're doing to these millions of human beings locked in boxes. And you know, the, I want to keep moving because I know we have a lot on this um, on the plate for today. But I'm going to throw it over to Nafisa. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to touch on one one more thing, you know, we have to keep in mind we are talking about Halloween, you know, and and. The fact that our children, you know, some of them dress up as prisoners, right? But we must also look at the fact that there are children, eight-year-olds, in prisons, locked away, in solitary. That is horrendous. The latter part of September and the beginning of October marks Hispanic Heritage Month. And so we celebrate the achievements of Hispanic people in the United States and how they contributed to our culture. And so one of the people who we would love to highlight is our sister, Dolores Canales. She is one of the people who has helped shape history in the United States. She's helped lead the Pelican Bay hunger strike leading to reform in California. She has been crucial. She's been a crucial part of anti-solitary. She is an advocate 
and especially in California, she's like, we have our space. And when it comes down to the work that she's doing in, in California, it is phenomenal. She's also, um, you know, uh, pushing for the Mandela bill, you know, and we mentioned that early on, you know, uh, in New Jersey, we were able to, uh, have regulations for solitary confinement. We were the first to do that. But when we have people like Dolores, right, and Vanessa and Sway, who are at the helm and all over the country, who are pushing to abolish prisons and solitary confinement, we know that that spirit uh, is something that will definitely reign victorious. And so unfortunately, uh, Dolores is not going to be joining us uh, this evening. And I would have loved to have just, you know, been blessed to hear her uh, share with us tonight. However, you know, we have our sister Vanessa, you know, with us who is going to be able to uh, not only speak to uh, the issues of solitary confinement, but also shed more light on the work that she's doing because, you know, it is also national mental health awareness you know, and so what we talk about when we discuss solitary confinement, we talk about trauma and how do we deal with that trauma? And, and that's for individuals who have not only experienced uh, solitary confinement, but also to family members who have had to experience a loved one living in solitary. So when we say that hell is a very small place, it truly is. And so I would like to uh, pass it over to my sister, comrade, and yours, and yours, Vanessa Ramos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Nafisa. It's just such an honor to share space. And Sway and Sarah, much love to you and to all who uh, are joining us and who will watch uh, this showing uh, at a at a later time. Um, my name again is Vanessa Ramos, and I proudly serve Disability Rights California. Disability Rights uh, California is California's protection and advocacy agency. So we are here to represent um, disabled Californians. Uh, we advocate, we litigate, and on the unit that I serve under my majestic leader, um, Eric Harris, Director of Public Policy, uh, we're able to shift, uh, shift the minds and hearts through legislative moves, um, disability rights, absolutely is in partnership in coalition with beautiful advocates um, like immigrant um, defense advocates and you know so many other um, amazing leaders in this space um, I, I think uh, uh, the team at unlock the box for putting uh, the information on the Mandela Act in the chat you know and um, for a link for um, our website, um, and a link to, uh, to to learn more about the Mandela Act um, in solidarity with uh, f my fellows who uh, may have uh, disabilities. I would like to give you um, a very short visual description of myself for those who are blind or who have low, low sight. Um, I have a brown, light brown skin. I'm wearing a light makeup. I have black hair that's slicked back in a ponytail to my side. I'm wearing a black shirt and I have a business coat that's gray. Behind me, interestingly enough, as fate would have it, is uh, I'm inside of a jail currently that we are uh, monitoring. Um, so I am in, in, so behind me, there's a, a lot of, of, of activity. Um, uh, that's blurred out. Um, so that's just a little visual description uh, of, of myself. Um, I would like to, to also uplift, as Nefisa mentioned earlier, you know, the importance of mental health awareness and Hispanic Heritage Month. You know, when I think about mental health, I, I, I know that 40% of people in solitary have mental health uh, challenges. Uh, they need support and not torture. We know that the stats are so high, knowing that people may not enter with a disability, but many times exit with disabilities. And we are in um, the care of the state, 
right? We know that it is unfortunate and quite disgusting to be abusive to those whose care um, we're, 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 we are under. Um, I can go on and on, you know, uh, I do wanna get to my uh, portion of the book where I with great pride um, get to read uh, the story of Judith Vasquez who is currently incarcerated in New Jersey. She is serving 30 years to life for first degree murder. Although she maintains her innocence, Vasquez spent three years in solitary confinement at the county jail before, during, and after her trial without ever receiving an explanation or any due process. She also experienced several additional years in solitary during her time in the maximum security section of state prison after she was raped by a prison guard and forced to abort in, in her cell. In 2013, she was finally transferred to a minimum security section of the prison, though she speaks of having trouble adjusting to being out of solitary. Now 60 years old, Judith Vasquez has two daughters and four grandchildren, two of whom she has never met. And here you are. There are things that people use every day and take for granted. Things such as nature. Who would ever think that to be denied nature would be such a big deal? I had no open window. My window was about four inches wide and maybe three feet tall. My view consisted of just bricks and barbed wire. If I could see maybe a dime-sized piece of the sky, it was a lot. As time went by, I noticed a little plant growing from between the bricks. I would look at that plant every day. It was the only view of nature I had. Oh boy, did I love the plant. It was my buddy, it was my pal. I would watch the breeze blow it from side to side. I would close my eyes and pretend the wind was blowing across my face. I never thought I would crave nature so badly. As time passed, I started to resent the plant. I wanted to be the one feeling that breeze. One day, I couldn't take it anymore. So I grabbed a plastic garbage bag and sealed it around the window, covering it completely. I refused to look at that plant and join the breeze I craved. Months went by and the cell was dark all day long. One day, I decided I had to tear down the plastic bag I felt I had to find a way to get air, so I began to scrape the rubber seal that held the window to the frame. I used my fingernails to scrape and scrape for days, weeks, and months. It got to a point that my fingernails began to bleed. They hurt so bad that I would cry, but I needed some air. I believe it took six months of scraping and bleeding before I finally made a tiny little hole. Wow. Wait. Sorry, I had to stop writing. My tears started to come down as I remember what I went through in that room. And at times I feel it just passed and forgotten, but I guess not. I want to stop there. Her story continues and I highly encourage you to get the book. And as I pause there, I want to uplift a comment that Sway mentioned about mothers and motherhood while incarcerated. And in this moment, as I'm reading this, I'm sharing with you that as a bisexual, bicultural mother who was incarcerated in solitary confinement, I can't help but to feel the torture that my fellow felt. I can't help while I'm in literally a jail. I'm in the sergeant's um, office, right? I can't help but to uplift the beauty and the resistance and the resilience of our community. You know, I do stand in solidarity with Ms. Vasquez, and I'd like to point out a very interesting point that I thought was just so magical, is that look at how she enters a, a setting where like many, you don't have to be incarcerated to understand the beauty of a plant, right? Man, nature is something that many of us could connect with Notice how she enters that honoring the beauty of nature, craving the wind, and slowly in that demonic setting, look at what she does. So I ask, 
is that Miss Vasquez's fault that she wanted to get a plastic bag and put over it? Or was that the system that she was in? Did the setting create that? And I want to do, you know, a super special shout out to Miss Dolores Canales that could not be here. But Mrs. Canales, thank you so much for leading this fight. And again, I stand in solidarity with so many of you. Um, I do want to share a call to action uh, for Disability Rights California, who is having a town hall with legislatures. And I know that the folks at Unlock the Box will put a link. It's on, thank you, it's on October 31st. It's 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time. Please check us out. We will be there moderating. And again, I thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share space with you today. Once again, powerful. And I, I just, I, I wanna, I wanna hear uh, from, from Sway and, and Sarah about what you heard about uh, Judith Vasquez. And, and so for me, uh, just quickly, I, when you said her name, I could have passed out uh, because she's Judy to me. You know, she's one of my sisters. She's one of the elders. She's one of the ones who, you know, taught me, as they say, how to jail, right? And to know of the suffering. Those are not stories that we share while we're going through it. So to hear how she suffered, it hurts. It really does. And so I just want to hear from uh, from Sarah and Sway how, how you felt about that, how... how to be denied air, right? Sway, do you wanna start? Yeah, it's just, you know, I think about being incarcerated, you know, for whatever it is that, um, you know, that puts us in those conditions and even this woman pleading her innocence. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the inhumanity that you're immediately subject to upon entering that facility, right? Immediately, you are stripped of your name and given a booking number. And that's pretty much gonna be your identity moving forward. And so the inhumanity starts upon entering that facility and it progresses and, and it gets more severe, it gets harsher. And to hear just like, there's no justification, there's no excuse as to what this woman was subject to at the hands of whether you, the county, the state, the correction officers that violated her, you know, and the mental um, state that she had to be in day in, day out as she endured not only being in solitary, but then the treatment at the hands of the COs. And then, you know, just having to abort in that, in that, you know, there's there's no amount of words that I can say that can justify or even for myself be able to relate to that. All I can do is like just, you know, reflect and internalize and then use that as these are the stories that as to why this this form of torture needs to be completely erased. Um, and that's just where my mind is looming. You know, I'm, I don't know if y'all could see, but I'm like continuing to like adjust. I'll be in and out of the camera, just all this reflection, both personal and then what I'm hearing. I don't know anybody that would be able to sit just comfortably after hearing these stories, but this is reality. And this is oftentimes, or these are oftentimes narratives that aren't allowed to be spoken, you know, that aren't allowed to be grieved. Um, and we're here to uplift those. We're here to hear these stories out, sit with them, digest them, and then speak about them because these should be mainstream narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're gonna continue to do, just make sure that these voices are continue to be uplifted. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I visited Judith at, she's at the Edna Mayhem facility in New Jersey, and we were able to have a contact visit. So I can remember hugging her and she's one of the many people that um, I had been writing her for months and months before I went to visit her. And by the way, interesting and amazing fact is that this facility is the same facility where Asada Shakur, the Black Panther that is still living in Cuba was busted out of in the 70s um, by a bunch of white radical feminists actually. Um, so that's the Edna Mayhem facility. Um, yeah, Judith is one of the many people that, you know, I expected her to just be falling apart, you know, a mess after what she's been through. She made me smile. She gave me, you know, strength. And um, I don't know the details of her case, but she is a victim. Um, and I don't, the percentage of women, men as well, um, the percentage of, of men that are survivors of sexual violence or, um, and women is just astronomical in prison. And the number of women that are in for standing up to their abusers or defending their lives um, is astronomical. And I think that this is an important point. Um, I come from a family of a lot of survivors, women that are survivors of domestic violence, um, including my mother. And um, these, this is like an important thing to note when you think about prison abolition. Yes, it's about shutting down prisons and jails because the less, the less people we have in prison and jail, the less people are gonna be tortured by solitary confinement. And the vast majority of people don't need to be there, period. And um, and the system is not serving even the ones that people that have done harm and need to be removed. The prison system is not serving them getting well and getting better. But anyone that is fighting for women's rights is an abolitionist because we are making it so women like Judy never go to prison. Anyone that's a feminist is also a, a prison abolitionist and is reducing the prison system by addressing the, the um, you know, the core issue of, of, you know, toxic masculinity and violence against women. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly that. Right. And also our children. Our children who are incarcerated and protecting them. And so October is also National Youth Justice Action Month. And um, we have Sway, you know, who will be able to uh, speak to that. But, you know, just to know that <sighs> there is a movement to end youth incarceration lets you know just where we are today in the world, right? And to know that we have uh, youth uh, the Youth Justice Action Movement to champion that. We know that there is a fight, but I'm, I'm, I, I must say that um, if we're gonna talk about ending incarceration, we have to talk about holding folks accountable, right? And so President Biden issued a proclamation at the beginning of October. And so I'd like to read a, a short excerpt, okay? During National Youth Justice Action Month, we recommit to transforming our juvenile justice system, shifting its focus from punishment to support, from the past to the future, by investing more in all children's health and well-being. Our youth can build a foundation for full lives and our whole country can benefit from their unlimited potential. Every child in America deserves a fair shot through good schools, safe communities, and equal opportunities. But some 36,000 young Americans remain confined in juvenile residential facilities, too often stuck in unsafe environments, facing adult charges or severe sentences, and living with untreated traumas that keep them from moving forward. Young people of color and young people with disabilities are disproportionately affected. We are not giving America's children the second chances they deserve. It is time to rethink our system in order to better reach the young people who need us most with guidance and support to keep them from coming in contact with the criminal justice system in the first place. Sway, 
Can you talk to us about this, brother? I'll do my best. Um, Psalm Sway, um, pronouns he, him, his, uh, 25 years old. Um, yeah, I'm a youth uh, organizer, youth justice organizer. I primarily work in supporting um, young people's reentry um, at the local level, state level. Uh, and I think, uh, I think to encapsulate, you know, why I'm here, what my role is in the movement, you know, I think I definitely navigated the school to prison pipeline, um, you know, and I think now I'm doing my best to help eradicate that. You know, I remember the first time ever being placed in custody, um, being placed in handcuffs. Uh, I was a sixth grader, um, and it was, the hand, it was at the hands of a school resource officer um, for stealing from my school. You know, I was poor. Um, you know, my means of having access to resources was very limited. And so, you know, out of a means of survival, that's kind of like one of the traits that I unfortunately picked up on. And then it led me in the hands of law enforcement. Um, luckily, that didn't result in me being placed in any facilities. But at 19, you know, being a product of my circumstances surrounded by gang violence, trauma, um, you know, I fell victim to that same cycle. And at 19, I was facing 23 years to life for my first um, time being uh, arrested. Um, you know, and just having the ability to come home um, shortly after that, you know, by the grace of whatever you want to call it, divine intervention, God, you know, or that was just my destiny to not be placed in car or remain in custody. Um, you know, I came home and then it took a little bit of, you know, uh, getting used to, I think the wake up call started uh, with inside. Um, but then I think I fully became aware of what I needed to do and how I needed to use my experience to help other folks in similar situation uh, happened shortly after I came home. Um, so since 2017 or 2018, I've been, you know, an organizer working with formerly incarcerated, currently incarcerated uh, youth. Um, and just, you know, seeing how most of our stories are very similar, how any of us can be susceptible to like the machine that is mass incarceration. Um, you know, with every young person that I work with, I just help supporting, you know, their journey either in the institutions or coming home. Um, you know, I think and even being a part of this movement that's helping like highlight and ultimately working to end the use of solitary confinement. I'm a co-host for um, a podcast called Not in Isolation, um, Voices of Youth, and it primarily works on uplifting the voices of young people, um, you know, who have lived uh, through um, solitary confinement. Um, you know, it's been recognized as a uh, like prisoners of war, you know, it was a tactic to use to torture, um, but it's regularly used in our youth facilities, in our adult facilities, in our, in our detention centers. And no one is exempt from that, your age, your race, uh, your sexuality, it, it, it's anybody can fall victim to it. Um, and so highlighting that reality is something that I try to work, um, work towards every day. Um, and yeah, with that, <laughs> Um, I'll go ahead and uh, start off my reading as well. Um, uh, it was titled um, A Sentence Worse Than Death, and it highlights the story of William Blink. William Blake. William Blake is in his 29th year of solitary confinement, currently being served in the Special Housing Unit, or the SHU, at New York's Great Metal Correctional Facility. Born and raised in upstate New York, he spent much of his youth in juvenile jails. In 1987, while in county court on a drug charge, Blake, then 23, grabbed a gun from a sheriff's deputy and in a thwarted attempt to escape, murdered one deputy and wounded another. He is now 52 years old and is serving a sentence of 77 years to life. Blake is one of the few people in New York held in administrative rather than disciplinary segregation, meaning he is considered a permanent risk to prison safety and is in isolation indefinitely. 
despite periodic poor form of reviews of his status. Prisoners call, prisoners call it the box. Prison authorities have euphemism uh, dubbed it the special housing unit or SHU for short. In society is known as solitary confinement. It is 23 hours a day locked down in a cell smaller than some closets. I've seen with one hour loaded to recreation consisting of placement by oneself in a concrete enclosed yard or in some prisons, a cage made of steel bars. There is nothing in a shoe yard but air, no TV, no balls to bounce, no games to play, no other inmates, nothing. There is also very little allowed in a shoe cell. Three, te three sets of plain white underwear, one pair of green pants, one green short sleeve button up shirt, one green sweatshirt, one pair of lace foot or laceless footwear that are, um, I'll call sneakers for lack of better words, 10 books or magazines total, 20 pictures of the people you love, writing supplies, a bar of soap, toothbrush and toothpaste, one deodorant stick, but no shampoo. That's it. No clothes of your own, only prison made. No food from commissary or packages, only three unappetizing meals a day handed to you through a narrow slot in your cell door. Your options as what you do to occupy your time in the shoe are scant, but there will be boredom aplenty. You probably think that you understand boredom, know how it feels, but really, you don't. What you call boredom would seem a whirlwind of activity for me. Choices so many that I'd likely be befuddled in trying to pick one over all the others. Life in the box is about an austere sameness that makes it difficult to tell one day from a thousand others. Nothing much and nothing new ever happens to tell you if it's Monday or Friday, March or, March or September, 1987 or 2012. The world turns, technology advances, and things in the streets change and keep changing all the time. Not so in solitary confinement, however. You know, I think I could keep going <laughs> and I could keep painting a deeper picture, but I think to me that encapsulates enough. Um, you know, there's not much glory, there's not much glamour, there's not much um, excitement that happens in solitary confinement. When I was reading it, you know, the stories that I've heard from young people you know, the stories that I read in this book, um, you know, nothing falls short of, of, again, to reiterate, torture, to be placed in, to be deprived of human contact um, day in, day out. Um, and I think, you know, what I, when I was reading out loud, it, it, what, you, what you read is what it, what it is, what you get. And I don't think there's any other way to dissect that further. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's uh, my piece from the book. You know, it, it's it's powerful from the first page to the end. Um, but I'll also open it up to. Um, oh, I think before that, oh, actually no, we'll, I'll open it up to this discussion. In the meantime, I gotta go plug in my laptop before it dies on me. <laughs> Thank you, Sway. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, well, one of the things that brings up for me is Billy, Billy Blake is, a, is a, um, one of the things that we, one of the problems that we encountered it, in, in making a selection for this book is that um, a really high percentage of people in solitary confinement are legally speaking illiterate. And it, it just gives you a glimpse at these are the people that society has truly failed. You know, the people that were kicked out of school um, for, because of anti or because of racist policies um, were never given a chance to, to learn to read and write and have ended up in the deep end of, of the system and, you know, being tortured. So Billy is an example of someone who's a phenomenal writer. Um, and one of the things I love about his writing is that he, he's representing the voices that we can't hear that can't 
necessarily be represented in this book. He writes about the people that um, can't write about their own experience. Um, so that is an act of you know, solidarity of, that many of these authors in the book might have had um, privilege to some de degree uh, mentoring access to become such amazing writers. And they're, they're representing the, the voiceless inside that are, whose voices are even more suppressed than their own. So I admire that about Billy. Um, I also just wanna say, Sway, um, the other thing that comes up for me with the work that you do and your experience, um, something that I learned about recently in California, and I don't know if this is still happening, but I actually live with um, two dads here and, um, one of, and we're a family together. And one of their adopted sons was in the system growing up. He was in the foster care system. And he was put in solitary confinement when he wouldn't be, when they couldn't find a, a foster care placement for him, they would put him in juvie because there was no family for him. And they would automatically put him in solitary because they said he was on a list of dangerous youth who he had never done anything wrong. He had never hurt anyone. And I thought I'd hurt everything, but to imagine our youth that we should be caring for, giving a home to, we're torturing them in solitary confinement um, is just, I was just wondering if you knew anything about that, if that was still happening in California. Um, I think within the recent years, it has changed. Um, but uh, no, that was, uh, you know, foster care youth oftentimes when there wasn't a placement for them would be either put in the hands of either probation um, or some of them would just be funneled into the carceral system. Um, but we saw there was oftentimes with youth um, in the US and in California was very interesting because at one point status offenses, and for those who don't know, things that are illegal only because you're a minor, being out past curfew, not going to school, you know, under drinking or smoking um, were subject enough to put you in the system. And we know that with the foster care um, system, um, a lot of it has been failing some of our youth, either being underfunded, um, lack of intentional care. Um, and so some of our youth are even, uh, some of the youth in the foster care system are, I would look at them as being on a fast track for incarceration. Um, and unfortunately, that was the truth for um, a lot of young people. I think within the recent years, um, you know, and a lot more um, emphasis on uh, keeping youth out of incarceration in California, um, that reality has shifted. But again, uh, within uh, just a few years ago, that would have been something that we might have not found uh, too uncommon. Mm -hmm. You know, I thank you. Um, I thank you all. This has been a discussion that we can definitely continue speaking about, and we should, right? But the one thing that keeps ringing in my mind is the trauma and how we deal with trauma. And we're not just talking about the, the trauma of just going through it. We're also talking about you know, trauma that individuals like, you know, yourselves and myself who are still in the work and you're still advocating and your boots on the ground, but what are you doing to take care of yourself, right? What kind of self-care are, 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 are we doing? You know, because we can burn out. Clearly, we have lived through the hell, but there are still many people left there. Although we get legislation pushed, it's nothing without implementation, and so there are still practices of solitary confinement, but under new names. And we must be clear about that. And we must also look at the fact that when we talk about solitary confinement, for those of you who may be struggling with it or not, just think about what would happen if you locked your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunt, your uncle, you lock these people away in a room for days and fed them through a slot in the door and didn't allow them to go out. And, and if you wanted to let them go out, it may be once a week, if that, you'd go to jail. Automatically, you know that's not right. You can't do that. 
Well, if we know you can't do that, then why are we standing by allowing it to happen, right? And so first, let's talk about self-care. One of the things that we can do, there is a mental health uh, toolkit. And so we have uh, Open MI, like Michigan, right? And so um, it has great mental health, a uh, great mental health toolkit for you. Please check it out on their uh, website. You can see it on the screen. And like I said, for, for those of us who just need to you know, just decompress, you know, this is a great, great resource uh, to look at. And once again, you know, we, we must hold individuals uh, accountable, you know, and so President Biden and Vice uh, President Harris, they promised to end the use of solitary confinement at the federal level if they were elected. And I do believe they were elected, right? Yet nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. So what are we going to do about that? So one thing that I say is uh, let's hold them to their word. And so let's get our phones out together and we're going to text, right? We're going to text Biden in all caps to 52886. Okay. And we're going to send this uh, an, an email and it's going to, you know, we're going to tweet it out. This is necessary and we should just do this together. I'm doing it now because this atrocity, these atrocious acts have to stop. And we're not talking about stop tomorrow. It needs to stop now. And so the action, the call to action is for right now. If we start now, then we've already won. And so I wanna ask each of our participants in one word, if you can just describe solitary confinement, and we urge, we urge our guests on uh, whatever platform you're on, when you think of solitary confinement from what you've heard, please put in one word that describes it. And so I'll start off and I'm going to say diabolical. Sway? It's been my recurring word all day, uh, torture. Sarah? I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do two. Can I do two? Absolutely. Dolores isn't with us, so in the spirit of our sister Dolores, do two. Thank you. Slow death. Mm. Absolutely. And Vanessa. Cruel. Inhumane. Yes, and it's criminal. And it's gruesome. Yes, it's gruesome, yes. And we must stop. So help us yes. put a stop to it. Yes, and, and help us uh, continue this work and also be a part of these discussions. And once again, please get the book. There is a lot you have yet to hear and read and know. And so thank you. We thank you for uh, our our guests who have, you know, been commenting, and it's just uh, wonderful for our participants to have uh, been able to uh, have this discussion. And we look forward to speaking with you again. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.